Here we go, Arnal. Are we we live? I see we on the air. Yes, it's st it's still a bit chaos. People are still uh, running around there. Everyone, yes, my voice. So there's still some people on their way. Um, with the rain caught up to Joseph and the family, so <laughs> so they will most probably disrupt us a bit. But very warm welcome to everyone uh, on on the line and everyone that's here uh, could make it out this morning. It's great to be together, especially to John, Pierre, and Pay. Um, hopefully, you've all just met them, except for Chris and Samet, maybe, but they're here for the first time. So Chris is there at the back. He's the real elder watching over all the youngsters, just checking us up. You see, he takes notes. And that is Sunnet. And then I think you know, know everyone uh, for now. Um, what a wonderful privilege to, to worship together, to come into God's presence. Uh, we live in God's presence, of course, but to be together and just be conscious of that and study His Word together is a huge privilege. So may you experience it in that way that you can worship Him, glorify Him, especially as we enter this Christmas season. Uh, we um, we will end off today by singing one of the Christmas songs. We've tried to record a couple of new things over the weekend, so we hope um, hope you can join in uh, the worship. For um, if you if you maybe online with us on Facebook uh, and you're new, um, and for you guys here for the first time, we we have a um, uh, a conversational style of worship. So uh, we we believe worship is not just uh, uh, someone that's up front here yeah. it's not just my uh, time to to come say something to you but we are really together to have a conversation with god and so you will see in our liturgy as well that we have times where we all speak together times where i lead us um, and um, and so we we make room and time for for confession for confessing our faith for singing together and then of course the highlight is when god when we open god's word and when he speaks to Brian. He's preaching us, leading us. Morning, Godfrey. And to me, you're on the big screen. Morning. <laughs> so, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so, and Loki, welcome, Loki. Uh, um, so, sorry, the guys are coming in. Um, so, um, where was, was I now? Arna will, uh, will put on the liturgy now. We're going to start with a, a passage from Luke. We're studying Luke. We, we began with a series leading up to, to Christmas um, uh, from the Gospel of Luke. And so our call to worship is also today from, from this Gospel. So where it says all, let's speak together, where it says leader, I will, I will lead us. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. If we um, declare God's glory and our dependence uh, on him, he responds. Once again, from Luke, and you will hear these words as the angel's words to Mary from last week's sermon. Greetings, O favorite ones. The Lord is with you. He is with us. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Amen. Let's praise God. We hope this recording uh, recordings work. We, we managed to uh, record a couple of new songs. So let's stand and worship how great is our God. We're going to sing together an echo of Mary's song that we're going to look at today in the Word. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. 
How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. To, um, to worship together like that and to confess our faith. And so we're working through one of our confessions. That's the Heidelberg Catechism, slowly but surely in this Christmas time, just pondering um, about uh, what does it mean, who's Jesus, uh, what is it about. Uh, and today I, I, I went to, um, in preparation, went to question and answer 21 of the Heidelberg Catechism that asks this simple question, what is true faith? What would you say? If you had to, to answer it, what is it? What is a true faith? You know, many people believe in all kinds of stuff, but what is a what is a true Christian faith? Um, listen to what the Catechism says: True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture. Say it with me. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel. And what is that? What is that trust? That God has freely granted, not only to others, but also to me, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. Let's end off by saying this together. These are gifts of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit. What a wonderful gift of grace. And that is how we also enter this worship. Um, true faith, head and heart, knowledge of things that happen, knowing that it's true, what we're going to read in Scripture today is true, but also trusting that um, this Jesus that we're going to hear of today, that Mary sings about, that uh, he also came for me. He didn't just come for others, but also, also for me. I don't know, you can move on to the next slide. So, what does God ask, uh, ask of us in view of his mercy? So, that is his mercy, and we can trust in it. But what does he ask of us in view of his mercy? Listen to, um, to Romans 12, that we, that we focused on last week uh, in the sermon, the whole thing of Mary giving herself. This is the heart of our Christian, Christian walk. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters and all believers, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Five, that is what you came here with, if you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus, uh, to renew this pledge. So, Lord, I'm, yeah, I am. I'm, this is my spiritual wor worship. Didn't start this morning when I start, started singing. It started when I gave myself to you anew this morning. And when I came here and said, I'm, I'm here to come and give myself anew. If you're still asking questions about Christianity, if there's stuff that you're still wondering about, um, uh, then, then please understand that this is the order of Christianity. It's not, it's not the biggest band or the biggest worship service or a lot of programs or stuff. This is the order of discipleship. Is, is by, by the grace of God, he calls me into a renewed relationship where I give myself over to Let's ponder that for a moment. Let's just take some time. I know this time of year becomes busy. But just for a moment, reflect. And if there's something that you have to confess before God, just bring, bring it before him. Um, uh, in terms of this, if you struggle to give yourself over to him, just, uh, just use this moment. Uh, welcome, Joe. Lost my ear, die. We will, we will do that later. Welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Is there enough chase? Thanks, Joel. To my Eastern Nufia, he's not too sure. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Just use this time. Um, look, look on, 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 the, on the screen as well. I've just put a passage from Daniel that you can just use as a means of confession. Um, just quietly in our hearts. Let's just become quiet for a bit. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Listen to this last sentence just if you've not read it maybe or just a reminder. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. What a wonderful thing to be able to run to God even with our weaknesses and our sin and our brokenness. Not away from him. He doesn't say go sort out your stuff and then come to me. He says, come to me with all your stuff, <laughs> all your brokenness. Um, let's sing about his mercy and forgiveness um, in the next song, Cornerstone. Um, so let's stand again, and then you can, uh, you can take your seats again. But let's stand and to remind us that Jesus is the cornerstone of his church. Let's stand. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord. Talk 
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, the faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, today, Lord, we, we want to thank you. The 22nd of November 2020, a great day that we should be glad and, and celebrate it as you made the day, Lord. Father, this morning, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for Calvary. We remember as we go again towards the end of the year that as our bodies are tired and, and our minds are weary with everything that's happening, but we're looking forward to the reminder of the 25th of December and uh, days around it for the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this morning, Lord, we want to thank you that we can still gather some in your church building, Lord, some in our own, um, your buildings that we stay in, Lord. Um, we thank you for this opportunity. We know of countries where people can be arrested, people can be harassed, some can be imprisoned, some can even be killed for gathering like we are today. Father, I pray this morning that you, you energize us, you open our hearts and minds, um, because we are the privileged ones who can talk, we can celebrate you without any of those impediments. Father, this morning I want to pray for the church movement in South Africa, um, in Randbeck and globally, that you exalt yourself, you keep showing yourself, you keep appearing to your people, to, to your members of your movement, Lord. Keep opening up our minds and our hearts, Lord. Um, this morning, I want to thank you, Lord, for how you helping us to go through the, the challenge of COVID-19 and the opportunities of COVID-19. Lord, as the numbers go down, the stories of it, uh, the, 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 the numbers coming back again and the second wave, we pray, Lord, that the COVID-19 is coming to an end because you want it to come to an end. Um, Father, we, we pray this morning again for our fellow brothers and sisters um, from this church and from outside who are not able to join in, that you keep blessing them, you keep them safe. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not well, Lord, that you, you keep working on their bodily health, you keep working on our emotional strength, Lord, um, that we, we keep seeing you as the healer of everything, both the mind, the, the spirit, and the soul. This morning, Lord, I want to put the government of, of our local constituencies, of our provincial constituencies of the South African national government as it, as it tries to find itself of all the challenges that we're facing that raise amongst them leaders who can turn their minds and hearts towards you for the purpose of your name lord to glorify you and to drive the project of peace that you lord can call them for have called them for um lord as we as we go through the day we remember guys like joseph who's looking for a job and all the others we remember it and all the guys who've got new jobs that lord we, we want you to sustain them father we love the good news thank you for the provi providence of the rain thank you that the whole country is is on a blanket of your good rains 
Um, Father, we thank you that you're helping our kids through the exams. We're asking you to keep their diligent young minds and, and take them away from distractions and energize them, Lord. Father, in the good news story, we love what you're doing with Candy and Martin, um, Herod's family that are expectant. We, we love what you're doing in all of our families, Lord. Father, we know that there are challenges with the economy, but because we are your kids, we pray and not in vain. We know that you are watching over our provision in, in each and every one of our households. Um, financial freedom, Lord, we don't pray for wealth. We pray, Lord, that you keep and sustaining and, and sustain us. Father, as the preacher is going to preach this morning, we ask you that as you've been doing in the last couple of months, we, we want to use this moment to ask you to open up our hearts and minds towards your word. Strengthen us in the book of the, the start of the great story of the birth of Jesus Christ and everything around it, the birth of Joseph, the parents that are going through this. And then help us to teach us um, the relevance of the story in our hearts and how we can apply and implement this word in our hearts. We ask you for all of this and thank you for all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We thank, uh, thank you, Godfrey, for just leading us um, in that way. And, um, and we into God's word. So, Brian, uh, over to you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Tanya is going to lead us in the reading. We're continuing Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 56. <laughs> In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is God's word. Um, let's just ask his help as we turn and, and open it Together, we thank you, Father, again, that we are gathered in your name. Through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit are present to work in us, to perform mighty, mighty deeds for your humble servants. Lord, would you just open our hearts, that we would hear the voice of our Lord, and that from here we would be able to go out and rejoice and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in all the world. Amen. If you, um, if you walk down any average suburban street on Saturday afternoon, either the box or plain New Zealand, or it's the Soweto Derby, and you're just walking down, you don't know what's happening. At some point, you're going to hear some, somewhere screams and shouts and cheers, right? Because people are watching 
the soccer or they're watching the rugby or you were at the World Cup win last year and people that you thought were generally very quiet and gentle people were jumping up and down. Okay. Why do we do that? We, we, sh we shout when, we, when we're excited, when we're happy. It's just part of who we are. A few weeks ago, we went for a walk at um, the Cradle Moon venue in Mulder's Drift. We hadn't been there before. We went on a nice long walk. We're just coming back around towards the, the dam. They've got this lovely dam wall that the water runs over the top. It forms a, a bit of a waterfall. It's a beautiful, just a picture, nice photographic. Anyway, we come in around, we couldn't see the dam, we didn't really know where we were. And all of a sudden, in breaking the silence, there's this scream, shout, cheers. It's, it's, I thought I was at, a, at Gold Reef City. People were just screaming. Oh, what's going on? And two or three minutes later, we finally came around to see what had happened. And this, this couple was there, and he had proposed to it in front of the dam wall. And there were like 20 other people who went, oh, that's amazing. We shout when we're happy. It's, it's just part of who we are remember as we're going through luke luke's first chapter hope shatters the silence right there's been this period of of long waiting for god's voice and now god is speaking and he's not just saying small things he is speaking big things we've had the proclamation of the messenger that john the baptist would go ahead of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, make a people ready for God. Then we've had, last week, we looked at the, the promise that, that Jesus, the Messiah, would finally come after so many generations of anticipation. And the word comes to a little girl in the town of Nazareth, a small little insignificant town, according to what most people would have thought. Hope is breaking in and shattering the silence. Now, one of the outflows of that is that God's servants who are filled with hope then continue to shatter the silence. Right? And in the introduction, and even in last week, we spoke about how we feel at times like we're living in God's silence. That even though we live on this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, that there is still this ongoing echo of silence, if we can put it like that just feels like sometimes we're living in in a, a occupied state i want to say possessed state but that wouldn't sometimes it feels like it's a possessed state as well but that's the world that, that we live in and as we continue through this passage we we now come as well last week we looked at mary as the servant who lives out romans 12 she she gives herself as a living sacrifice to god with some sense that it's going to shatter all of our own hopes and dreams, but bring about incredible things for the glory of God and his coming kingdom. This passage now, as, as Tanya read the Mary song, it's, it's called, you might see in the, in the ESV, it has the little title, The Magnificat. It's from the old uh, English way of referring to this Magnificat as the, the Latin word from the it was translated in the Vulgate. That's the first word of this prayer. My soul magnifies the Lord. This uh, passage really is giving us the heart song of a servant of God. And so what we want to do as we just walk through this is to reflect on what is a, a servant of God, one who is, is seeing God at work. What is, the, what is the response? How do hope-filled servants of God respond to God what what does that look like and, and how does it reflect in us and what do we learn that the Lord would have us do as as his servants and here's what it comes down to God's servants know true joy now you've heard that but what does it look like we often speak about joy and we often speak about true joy but here we have some very interesting examples of it they speak they, they know this true joy because they know God as their God. Not a God, not the God, not the best God, not the Christian God. They know God is their God and their Savior. They trust God implicitly. They see God at work when they look around at the world around them, when they read the newspaper or they, they're looking at what's happening in the, in the news. They've seen God at work. And because of all of that, they speak into the silence. They cannot remain quiet. 
So let's begin just uh, understanding this, this joy that we see in these two women now. Um, Luke is bringing together the two threads that he's introduced. We started out with Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then we get Mary, and now the two of them come together. They're, they're Mary, Elizabeth is Mary's uh, elderly relative, if we can put it that way. Um, they're probably cousins. She lives in the hill country of Judea. Mary lives in, in Nazareth. She receives this message from, from Gabriel, and she goes with haste. Why would she do that? I think there's a sense that Elizabeth is the one who would best understand what's happening to Mary. Elizabeth had also received a message from Gabriel. And so she goes to find somebody that, that can just comfort her and relate to her and, and just encourage her. But there's something very interesting that, that happens. If you glance back to verse 36, when Gabriel is still speaking to Mary, um, when Mary had, had asked him, how will this be? And she will become pregnant. Uh, Gabriel explains to her, the Holy Spirit will come on her. The, the child will be called the son of God. And then verse 36, he says, behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with, with her, who was called barren. In other words, the pregnancy of Elizabeth is a bit of a sign to Mary herself. A confirmatory sign that what Gabriel said to Mary is going to be true. And so there's that sense that she runs off now to go visit her, her cousin and go and see what the Lord has said and, and, and be encouraged that what God has said is, is true. But now we find in these, these two women this response, this incredible response. As Mary comes into Elizabeth's house and she, she greets her, you can imagine the Judean hillside being shattered, the silence being shattered by the shout of a woman who, who cries out. So Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry, verse 42, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She shouts because she's caught up in what God is doing. And it's very interesting that the joy that both Elizabeth and Mary express it's got very little to do with their actual circumstance. The core of it is God's word being fulfilled. God has spoken. And I can see that God, what God said is coming true. And that is extraordinary. That is what gets Elizabeth excited, right? Yes, she is, she is over the moon that God has blessed her, that God has looked with favor on her. She says at the end of the first section we looked at uh, verse 25 the Lord has done for me the Lord has done for me in the days when I looked at you looked to me to take away my reproach among the people Elizabeth is is excited about what God is doing but the core of that is that she knows that what God has said he will do and she can see it right in front of her eyes and so God's word is the center of her joy and the fulfillment of that is the center of her excitement. Now, what's interesting for me is if you if you consider these two women, we spoke about Mary last week. Mary, at the beginning of her life, being called into what, on the one hand, is the most extraordinary calling that any mother in human history could hope for. She will be the mother of the Messiah. But along with that is all of what is tied up in the loss of, of what she had hoped for. Any of her own hopes and dreams are also shattered. Because now God has called her into something that she could never have expected. She could never have planned for herself. Elizabeth is at the end of her life. And having lived sadness in her whole life, God has now blessed her with an extraordinary thing and, and given her a child. There's a remarkable contrast between these two women. One coming to the a joyful end to her life and the one starting her life with what is going to be painful. And yet both of them are filled with the same sense of joy in response to God's word, which reminds us yet again what we know to be true, but our hearts cry out against it. Joy is not about your circumstance. 
Being joyful in God is not about the circumstance that you find yourself in, but in seeing God at work in those circumstances. That is where the joy bubbles up from, right? And so it's not about us being happy. It's about us seeing God at work. What, what, are, what are you looking for in your own life to give you joy? Are you feeling just heavy laden and, and depressed? Are you just hoping that your circumstances are going to get better? If only I could get this thing, then I'd be happy. If only I could get that perfect job. If only I could fix my husband. If only, if only, if only. Well, what we see in God's word again and again and again and now illustrated in these two women is there are no if onlys. When we've heard God's word and we know that God is at work, that's the foundation of our joy. Are you pursuing happiness just in, in your circumstances? This reminded me, Thomas mentioned the, the Heidelberg Catechism. Do you remember the first question? What is your only comfort in life and in death? Your only comfort? That I am not my own. I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the heart of joy. I know that God is at work. So the hopeful servants have joy in God. And that's not where it stops. We move on because we see as reflected in the answer to, to question one of the catechism that hopeful servants know God as their God and their Savior. Look at verse 46 and 47 and just listen to the wording of Mary as, as she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior. If I look around just at many people in general who, who say they're Christian, many people know about God, but so few are true servants who know Him. Many people have heard about this God that can help them when they're in trouble. The God that says, pray when you need help. And, and they know how to pray when they need help. But beyond that, God is not real. God is not personal. He's not my God. He's just the God who helps me. He's the Christian God. He may be the best God, but he's not my God. Some of these people even know about the scriptures. They want to argue, they want to debate, they want to discuss, they want to be right. But is he, is he their God? Well, you see in Mary, where's her natural response? Where, where does she go to after she's, she's heard Elizabeth cry out, blessed are you? Uh, it might be that that is right to read that was as an immediate response as she heard Elizabeth but this is a three-month visit. And it's interesting that Luke doesn't record anything else in three months except for the greeting and the song. And so you can, you can well imagine that Mary had reflected and reflected and reflected and written the song, maybe even refined it over time. And the core of her response is, my God has done this. He is my Savior. Elizabeth says a remarkable thing to Mary, if you just glance back up. As she has said, verse 42, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Then she says, verse 43, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Not the mother of the Messiah, not the mother of the one that God promised. She says, the mother of my Lord is coming to me. Friends, do you know about God? Maybe from your parents, maybe from church, from things that you've read, things you've heard about. Or do you know God from your heart, from his spirit? 
It's not that Mary is in any way extraordinary as a saint. And we must be careful with that. She is most highly favored because God has put his favor on her. So we're not saying be Mary. You can't be Mary. There's lots of reasons that I'm sure you can think of that you can't be Mary. But look at what happens when God speaks and his people respond. You're looking for joy. You're looking for hope in your circumstances or in this God that you simply know about. Here's the call to you this morning. Is he your God? Or is he just your parents' God or that God over there? Here's the challenge. His servants know him truly, intimately, personally, and they're able to cry out, my God, but not only that, they call him my Savior. And Mary says this, she calls him my Savior, not, not because he has simply looked on a poor person and he's now going to make her rich. Quite the opposite is going to happen to Mary. But she knows, as, as we reflected on Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, what does Daniel know? His people there who are in exile are impoverished because of their knowledge of God. The, the people are there because they lack knowledge of God, but they are God's covenant people. And God will have mercy on them. The core of calling God your Savior is to know that only God can save you. We are, as Daniel says, rebellious in God's eyes. See, God doesn't owe us anything. We owe a great debt to God. But to know that he has turned his face towards the, us who just don't deserve anything good from him. We can say he has, for a reason that I just cannot explain, he has, he has looked on favor. He's looked on me with favor. You often think when you hear that, that statement of Gabriel to Mary, if you think back to, to Genesis where, where you're introduced to Noah, you have a similar kind of thought that says you, you have found favor in God's eyes. Well, it's not because you were, you were particularly good or clever or fancy or righteous and God was looking at oh, there's one I can use. It's not that God was scanning through Israel one day and he was looking in Jerusalem and he found no one. He was looking around Bethlehem and he found no one. Eventually his glance gets around to Nazareth and he goes, oh, there's one I can use. No, it's got, it's got nothing to do with Mary. God, in his goodness, in his wisdom, and his mercy and his grace, comes to Mary and he says, you have my favor. I am blessing you for my purpose. And that is why she can say, well, he is my savior. Because if he didn't come to me, if he didn't save me, I'd be sunk. You might want to ask, what does it mean, save? What, is this, what does it mean to be the savior? And a good word to plug in there is rescue. Right? God must rescue us to bring us back to himself. And friends, there is only one savior. That's what Mary knows. That's what Mary says. That's the anticipation, the hopes and fears of all the generations up to this point that Mary hears Gabriel speak. This question of who is going to rescue Israel. And there is only one. So again, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for to rescue us? What do I think is going to save me? What am I leaning on to be my rescuer? Is it my skills, my ability to work, my worldly wisdom that I can fathom my way through, get my way into a good career? Is it because I'm generous to other people that I think I'm going to be saved? Is it because other people are generous to me? Is that what I'm waiting for? I'm just waiting for other people to come and fix my circumstances and then everything will be sharp. Well, Mary just says, God is my savior. Because she knows that God is her savior, she shows us the trust that hope-filled servants have in their God. 
right? As God shatters the silence and speaks hope, his servants respond in joy. His servants know him as their God and Savior. And in all of that, they trust God implicitly. And if you know that phrase, we use it quite often. We, we trust something implicitly. I have to go and look it up to see what it actually means. But think about it. If you trust something implicitly, it means that there's just, it's just natural to you. Maybe you have that relationship with, with your husband or your wife or a parent. Just there's no question in your mind, I will trust. Whatever that person says, I will trust. Is that how we respond to God? Do we trust God with whatever it is that he calls us to? As Mary had said, may it be to me as the Lord has said. Whatever he has called me to, that's what I must do. If you look at verse 50, 48 to 50, we continue through a song. He's looked on the humble estate of, of his servant. He's turned his eyes to me who deserves nothing from him. For well, behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. He who is mighty has done great things to me. Holy is his name. Mary knows that she needs God. Mary knows her position before God. And as she says, the mighty one has done great things. What does she call him? Holy is his name. What does holy and mighty have to do together in Mary's thought? Well, who else could do these things? There is only one God. He is set apart from his creation. He's not like us. He doesn't owe us anything. We can't describe him in any way that is like anything. We can't compare him to anything. We can't, we can't find anything that helps us understand God until he speaks holy, set apart, completely different. Mary looks and says, the mighty one has done extraordinary things. He is above and beyond description. Holy is his name. Sometimes we think God is like us. If I were to do this for somebody, well, then God would also do that for them. No, friends. God is, God is way beyond. God can't be put into a box. But what we can trust about God is the things that he tells us about himself. We know that he is a promise-keeping, faithful God. So if you just glance down to the end of her song, you'll see that she reminds us that he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Remember, in, in Mary's time, the people are waiting for the fulfillment of Messiah. And here it is. God has not forgotten in the midst of the silence, he hasn't forgotten or abandoned his people. He hasn't left his plan. He's not waiting for a better time to come back and fulfill it. He's not waiting for us to get things right, which is part of what the Pharisees' problem was. If we can just build this world, if we can just fix what's broken, then God will come. If you're going to wait for that. You're going to wait a very long time. No, what we see here is that the hope-filled servants of God recognize that they have nothing to offer God and that they need God completely. This is the opposite of pride. See, proud people can't reflect on the goodness of God to them. When I'm proud and I think, oh, I got this good thing. Oh, I deserve that. Right? This, this job went my way. Oh, I must be pretty good at my job. I was waiting for this breakthrough in a relationship. I was waiting to figure this one out. Oh, I was able to, to reconcile. Oh, I must be pretty good with that. My exam went well. I must be pretty good. Proud people can't think about the goodness of God towards them because we're always focused in on ourselves, in our pride. So think about it. Are we prideful in our, in our abilities? Are we prideful in the view of the world that we have in our world view, are we thinking about how great we are as humankind? Well, 
Mary recognizes because God has spoken to her that she doesn't deserve it. And she is humble in that state. God has humbled her. That is where we come to a position of trust. Joy, looking to God, my God, trust in God. That's going to flow out in as we gaze across the horizon and we look at how, how this world is forming up. The hopeful servants who trust God look and see God at work. And Mary says a couple of remarkable things. If you look at verse 51, she begins with the statement, and you might ask, where does this come from? He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. What does she mean by shown strength of his arm? You remember we looked just not very many weeks ago at the armor of God. Turn back with me to Isaiah 14. Oh, sorry, Isaiah 59 verse 14. Isaiah 59 verse 14. Isaiah says that the, the justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. For truth has stumbled in the public squares. And uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Do you ever feel like that when you watch the news? Zondo Commission. Truth is lacking in the public square, right? Does it, do you feel like that? Well, this is Israel in Isaiah's day. And then he says, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. In other words, God is looking at his people who are supposed to be his witness in the world. And it's as if he notices that there's a problem. Now, we know that God doesn't notice that there's a problem. But this is the way Isaiah describes it. God is looking He's not blind because there is no one on earth that is strong enough to fix what is broken. Isaiah says, then his own arm brought salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversities, adversaries Repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render pay, repayment. And so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and from his glory and his glory from the rising of the sun. He will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come from Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. His own arm brought him salvation. Mary reflects back on this promise, the expectation that God alone can be our savior and he's not weak in the midst of the silence. We look at our world and we think, where, where is God? Where is the arm of God? Well, the arm of God was born in a manger and lived a perfect life until his own enemies Put him to death, but death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him down because he lived the righteousness of God. And having died your death and my death, he was raised again. And the arm of the Lord rules from heaven. And Mary says, Look at what God has done. In God bringing salvation to his people, he has scattered our own pride. You remember the Tower of Babel? Where mankind got to a point where we were so full of ourselves and we decided we don't need God. We're going to rebel against God. We're going to take control of the heavens and we built a tower as tall as we could get it. And like that, suddenly we all have languages to study at school can't understand each other because we are scattered because God scatters the proud our hearts conjure up all these thoughts he says not just not just prideful actions it is right to the very core they are proud in the thoughts of their hearts the very 
thinking of their worldview, their ideologies are prideful against God. And that is the world that we find ourselves in today. Our hearts, unless God saves us and rescues us from ourselves, our hearts cannot and will not know him. We deny God. And so everything that flows out of the heart is anti-God. And that is what you see in the world around you. The ideologies that drive our economics, our sociology, so how we make money, how we think the world is put together and people are supposed to relate to each other, what drives our politics, they're all God-hating philosophies. That's, that's what humanism is. That's who we are as a people. That is the world that we live in, friends. But God is not weak in the silence of this world. His own arm is bringing salvation. And God has looked with favor on us as his servants. Because if he hadn't, we would be caught up in this tornado, this hurricane of worldview that will not and cannot acknowledge God as God. God will scatter the proud. God will bring down the mighty from their thrones. Because there is only one king. And even today he rules the nations. Think about it. It wasn't Herod who claimed to be the king of the Jews that received the Messiah. It was just a young girl in a little town. There's nothing going on for her. And there comes the Messiah. In humility, he comes to his people. And so he has filled the hungry with good things. He's rejected the rich. Luke, in chapter 6, in his version of the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus, Jesus says this right at the middle of chapter 6, verse 20. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples. He says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. You see, the pride, the prideful, who are filled with themselves, leave empty of Jesus. But when we realize our humble estate, when we realize that we are just weak and need God, that he alone is our savior, he fills us with good things. Those who claim to be rich go away empty-handed. But those who know they need Jesus are full. And what does our pride tell us, friends? Our pride says that Jesus is like something you go to a, you go to a Christian bookshop, right? And you pick up a book that says, how to be saved, just add Jesus. That's how many Christians tend to live. I can do this, I can have that, I can have my whole life, I just need to plug Jesus in at relevant times. I'll go to church when it's time, I'll, I'll, I'll give when it's necessary, I'll participate in a couple of events that don't inconvenience me too much, and then I'll be a Christian. Mary's whole life is completely opposite to that. There was no way for her to follow God without giving it all up. And daily, daily, daily going after God. Servants see God at work because they live as living sacrifices. They give themselves over to God. They're transformed by the renewing of their mind. God will bring down a worldview that is against him. And we are exposed to this every day. At school, you are taught that if God exists, you just pick the right one and you'll be fine. But actually, it's not really worth it because science has now won out on the day. We are much better. We taught theories as facts. We taught anti-God as truth. And we can look around this world and go, where, where, where is God in the silence? Well, the mighty will be brought down. Praise God that he has looked on us with favor to rescue us from a worldview that hates him. If you've ever tried to sit quietly in the back of the classroom, maybe, or in the back of a meeting room and open your, your sparkling water, what happens? 
inevitably you end up wet and everyone's looking at you. It's like sitting quietly in the room and you open your can of Coke. That's how joy bubbles out of Christians. Have you ever thought about that? See, God's servants who have seen the hope that only God brings cannot stay quiet. That's why Elizabeth shouts across the Judean countryside. And so for us, friends, here's this question. See, for Luke, in Luke's gospel, joy is a background theme. It's always there. He promised, Gabriel promised that at John's birth there would be great joy. There's this blessedness that Elizabeth speaks of with Mary. And Mary says, I am blessed by God. What does it mean to be blessed? We think of blessed as, well, when you got a car because you, you didn't deserve, ah, oh, I've got a car. God blessed me. I got a job. God blessed me. I got good friends. God blessed me. When you take those things away, does God still bless you? Is blessing all about the good things that I experience and receive from God? Or is blessing about being happy in God through the Lord Jesus Christ because he alone is my God and my Savior? We need to redefine our thinking. And out of that, the, the, the effervescence, there's a word that nobody uses anymore. Do you know what it means? Well, you usually know it because you've got tablets. So you put a tablet in water, go, shh, that's effervescent. It means bubbling up, pouring out. And we see that in these two women who are so caught up in what God is doing that they cannot stay quiet. We, friends, break the silence. What characterizes our conversations today? Is it hope or despair? Is it, look what God is doing in the world and I will trust and I will wait for him to finish and see where he goes with this because I know that Jesus will bring down the mighty from their thrones. I know that he will tear down every worldview and philosophy that sets itself up against the knowledge of him. Or is it the government again? Oh, that teacher that hates me. Oh, if only I could get out of this job. Where is your conversation? That's what reveals our hearts. So let's sum up. What do we learn from young Mary and her response to God as a servant? What does her heart song teach us? If you're looking for hope, there's only one place to look. Look to God. And if you want joy, Get into God's word and listen for his voice. Let him examine your heart. Let the Holy Spirit show you where you need to turn from your pride and your sinfulness and seek the good news of forgiveness in Jesus. If you want to understand what God is doing in these days of silence, if you want to find out what God is doing, let him transform your mind Renew your mind so that you can see him in action. Spurgeon said, I read the newspaper to see what my father is doing in the world. We need to think God's thoughts after him. Seek his wisdom in these days of what we would call his silence. And out of all of that, friends, we need to speak God's hope. Because the light of the world has come into the darkness. And we, because of his grace and his mercy and his goodness to us, have been entrusted with that light to carry it. Let our conversations, as Paul said, be seasoned with salt, filled with hope. That is how God will continue to speak into the world. Hopeful servants shatter in the silence. Let me pray for us. Oh Lord God, there is so much that we can still learn from Mary and Elizabeth. But because of your favor to us, we can say that at least this. You have looked on fa as, with favor on your servants. 
We deserve nothing because in our pride we think we are something and yet the reality is that we are in a humiliated state before the righteous God of the universe. What is man? That you are mindful of him, the son of man that you think of him. And yet you have given us your grace. You have caused us to know you. You have poured out your goodness on us who deserve nothing. And so we can say, I know that I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord God, would you bury these words deep in our hearts that they would germinate and flourish and produce fruit in the week to come. On this first day of the week, we turn to you and we ask for your help as we go out as your servants to speak your hope into the world. And Lord, I pray for our hearts here this morning that there may be some here for whom God is just an idea, just somebody who can help. Holy Spirit, would you move on each one of us this morning? Break our pride. Humble us before you that we can truly call out to God and say, my God, my Savior. Lord, we thank you for your word. For your name's sake, may you be glorified. Amen. Thanks, Brian, for leading us in that. Please continue to work through this word. This passage, just go read it. You can read. We're going to go, I think, to the end of chapter 2. Go read it. Go ponder it. Ask good questions um, so that we can really learn and grow together. Let's continue to shatter the silence now by singing one of the Christmas hymns, Joy to the World. And um, it's just a response to this joy that we are called to. Let's, uh, let's stand and worship God. Listen to God sending us out into this world with this promise from Numbers. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you his peace. Amen. Friends, please um, go well. You can um, uh, uh, give um, uh, by our WhatsApp or um, or what do you call that thing, Zappa? So um, so so please <laughs> please do remind to give um, as a first token of your gratitude. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bless those who've been with us. We're just gonna have some fellowship still here. Yeah? Um, enjoy the day. Sorry, Thomas, will you just say something about our stationary fund for the beginning of next year? Um,
um, yes, for those of us still with us, uh, haven't le- left us, we have a stationary funds fund that you can donate to. It's for the kids, um, for some of our kids who still need funding for the school and everything, and just to help them uh, with funding. Please, you can say the CCC stationary fund on your giving. Snapscan, Zapper, or your um, your details there. Uh, just the EFT. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs>